Hi, I'm Will Howard, and today we're going to visit one of the most interesting houses on the Eastern Shore. Probably the most famous house on the Eastern Shore. It was built in 1794, and it sits here on 1,300 acres, and it's Y House. And it's been home of the Lloyds and Tillmans for 12 generations. We're going to go inside and we're going to visit and talk with the owner. We're going to tour the grounds and interview some people. And also we're going to talk to a reenactor of Frederick Douglass, who was, is to arrive today in a historic moment. Like most of the uh, waterfront on the eastern shore, this part of the, the, this land would have been um, settled in the third quarter of the 17th century. They would have built almost certainly an earth-fast house here. The support buildings that they needed for tobacco culture um, and slave housing, there's no question at all that this would have been land um, managed under the plantation system and with a slave workforce. Um, and in typical form, um, we see later generations of more permanent buildings. The earliest important building here is presumably the captain's house, which we think dates to the second quarter of the 18th century and is believed to have been part of a larger, more elaborate, multi-part house that was here through the middle of the 18th century, and then after the revolution uh, was replaced with the house that you see today. We don't have really firm date for the main house, but it seems to date to either the 1780s or the very beginning of the 1790s. There's a sig dated signature, um, Edward Lloyd IV and his uh, wife signed a window here in 1792, and there is a burst of furniture purchases in the early 1790s that also reinforces that idea. Uh, and uh, so what we have is uh, a, a multi-part house that owes much of its design to formal English pattern books of the period. This is as good a house as you will ever see in Maryland or anywhere else. It's very well documented in, in uh, in broad terms, even though we don't have a specific uh, construction date, and it has virtually a full complement of outbuildings, including the best orangery in North America, I'm sure, right behind us, and certainly the best family cemetery that I have ever seen in my career in Maryland. We're with Orlando Rideout with the Maryland Historic Trust. He is an architectural historian. Take us back to 1790. Okay. What we have here, we're at, in the middle of one of the most intact 18th century um, plantations in Tidewater, Maryland. It uh, would have included thousands of acres stretching up along the river here and all the way out to uh, Eastern Bay. And uh, this area had been settled since the third quarter of the 17th century. The house that we see today and the, and the green uh, orangery or greenhouse behind us um, would date to pr probably right after the Revolutionary War, would have been the, at least the second generation of housing here, probably even the third generation of housing on this site. We have some archaeological evidence for an earlier house that stood out here on this far side of the, of the main garden here. Uh, and there's a brick building over here from the second quarter of the 18th century. It's called the Captain's House, but it was part of a larger uh, uh, dwelling house that, that stretched along this side of what is now a garden. And the archaeological evidence associated with that was found back in 1997 by an archaeologist from the Western Shore, Al Luckenbach. Um, <coughs> the the orangery behind us is one of the most extraordinary buildings in, uh, in America. It's virtually completely intact to the post-revolutionary war period and the central section of it may actually prove to be pre-revolutionary war uh, with some alterations to how the, the side sections uh, worked. And uh, you'll see immediately, it says what it is by the amount of glass there. It's all glass and as little wall surface as possible. Um, and then it had a billiard room in the second story up here. And the billiard table was made by John Shaw and still exists in wow. Winter Tour Museum in Delaware. Cool. Um, and this wasn't even their main house. This was their 
summer house? Well, they had two houses. Uh, Edward Lloyd IV, who, who would have built this house and presumably also the, the uh, orangery, uh, also had a house in Annapolis. It's known as the Chase Lloyd House on Maryland Avenue. It, that house was started in the late 1760s by uh, Samuel Chase, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he figured out that he was in over his head. He was building more house than he could afford. He sold the unfinished brick shell of the house to Edward Lloyd IV, who could practically have probably paid for it out of, out of cash flow. Yeah, what did these guys do for a living? Well, uh, the Lloyds were big landowners. They were heavily involved in mercantile activity. He was involved in uh, government. Um, he, he basically had, uh, he was a player in almost every important um, aspect of the Maryland economy in the latter part of the 18th century. Thank you. We're here with Charles Pace. Charles is a Ch Chautauqua performer. Yes. And Chautauqua means what? Chautauqua ix actually is a Seneca word, an Indian word, uh, Iroquois, and we don't actually know what it means, but the nearest we can figure, it means a coming together. This was based on the Chautauqua Society that was founded actually around 1874 in upstate New York, around Lake Chautauqua. And Lake Chautauqua is shaped like two moccasins tied together. And so when Daniel Hale Vincent formed the Chautauqua Society, it was bringing people together, really to talk about religious ideas and themes. But in this case, it means you're going to bring Charles and Frederick together, right? I'm going to bring Charles, Frederick, and the community together. Okay. So it's a coming together of a community to talk about ideas from American history and our cultural tradition. Okay. So it's the community coming together. Well, Charles, become Frederick right now and tell me about this place. This is Y House. This is the form, the Lord Plantation that I was born, oh, nearest I can figure, 1817, but quite frankly, slaves know about as much of their births as horses or cows know about theirs. But this is the big form. The Lord's own 12 forms in this area. Uh, my mother, uh, Betsy Bailey, and uh, uh, her mother, uh, my grandmother Betsy Bailey, and her uh, daughter Harriet Bailey was uh, a part of the Lord form. And this one, it was controlled by Mr. Aaron Anthony, who was actually the man who owned me. So I was not actually owned by the Lords, but I was owned by the man who was the uh, head overseer of what we call the Great House Farm. And this is the Lord. As a little boy, I was here. And believe it or not, the man who wrote the Star Spangled Banner, uh, Francis Scott Key, was entertained on that very veranda there. And so it's been a, an emotional experience for me to have left up that river as a little boy going to live in Baltimore to be a company keeper for uh, little Tommy and to come back and to be received by the Lords uh, as an equal and to be entertained there shows how far I've come, but really it shows how far we in this country uh, have evolved over that, uh, over that period of time. So did you consider the Lloyds family also? We all in some ways considered ourselves family because we lived here, we ate here, we prayed here, uh, folks died there, they were buried. So in a larger sense, I guess you could say, I consider them family, yes. Tell us about uh, Frederick Douglass and Talbot County specifically. Frederick Douglass was born here in Talbot County in 1818. He had thought he was born in 1817, but Preston Dixon in his book Young Frederick Douglass discovered indeed it was uh, in 1818. Grew up here and then when he was six or seven, his current order at that time, uh, Thomas All, sent him to Baltimore to live with his brother, Hugh Ald, and his wife. And he stayed there for six or seven years to be a company keeper for their son, Tommy. When his former owner, Aaron Anthony, died, he was sent back to Talbot County to get the property divided up and uh, discovered that uh, he would be sent back. 
eventually he did come back to Talbot County as a young boy and he was uh, farmed out to a Mr. Edward Covey who was a slave breaker because Frederick had grown up in the all household and he quote unquote didn't know how to act like a slave and so when you would have a young man like that you would form him out to someone who would literally break his spirit so he lived with Covey for a year and he did break his spirit not totally until he had a fight about six months into the captivity and uh, he felt as though I'm a slave in my mind though not in fact. <clears throat> they eventually feared for his life. He walked 12 miles behind a group of horses and the sheriff and other folks with uh, two of his cousins some other folk uh, for plotting an escape and because they could never find the passes that they had forged, he told his conspirators to eat the passes, and they managed to destroy the passes. There was no hard physical evidence, and so he was uh, set free. But all knew, and he had been told, you, you don't get that nigga away from here, we gonna kill him, and we don't like you for having him here. So they sent him back to Baltimore as much to protect his life as anything else. Is that where he got his education, in Baltimore? That's right. He got his education from Miss Sophia All. He be began there, and Miss Sophia uh, taught him the rudiments of reading until Mr. Hugh found out. And he said, Frederick Douglass says this in his autobiography, he says that if you teach that nigga to read, it will ever unfit him to be a slave. Learning will spoil the best nigga in the world. If he ever learns how to read, he will forever be a slave. Douglas at that point said, I knew what the course of freedom was, and that became his ticket out of slavery. Mrs. All would no longer teach him, and so Douglas uh, would turn, as he said, my white playmates into my teachers. So his white friends, as they learned in school, they taught him, and gradually over a period of time he learned to read. But it was from that uh, reading by Miss uh, Sophia that got him on the road to learning, and as he said, it was that outburst by Mr. Hugh to let him know how serious reading was. Well, he escaped in August, I'm sorry, February, uh, September 3rd, 1838, into New York. He had met a free woman in Baltimore, uh, Anna Murray, and they were a member of a East Baltimore Mental Improvement Association, which was like an intellectual organization of free blacks. They did not like free blacks and slaves to intermix, but he could hire out his own time, and he was able to do that. He then went <coughs> into New Bedford, Massachusetts, and that was the real life-changing experience. He came in contact with William Lord Garrison in August of 48, I believe. He gave a talk on Nantucket Island, and he was brought into the fold of the Garrisonians and stayed with them until the early 1850s. Uh, he then joined with people like Garrett Smith in upstate New York and became a political abolitionist and stayed an abolitionist until the end of the Civil War. But it all goes back, as he said, I am an Eastern Shoreman, I consider myself an Eastern Shoreman, and it's not that I hate Maryland, it's just that I love freedom more. We're in the graveyard here at White House now. There's a there's a photograph of him, or there's a painting of Frederick Douglass here. It's a, more of a line drawing in his last autobiography, uh, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. There's a depiction of Douglass in the graveyard here. When the Alls met him back uh, where they met me today, they would walk, made the trip up here to the veranda, and he requested to go and visit it visit the grave, and that he did. So yes, there's this line drawing in the back of his uh, last autobiography depicting him in the graveyard. We're with Carol Chisholm, who is a docent here on the property and, and knows a lot about it. Tell me, um, there were 12 generations of families that lived here. That's correct. And there were 12 generations of the Lloyds, and the Lloyds were extremely active politically throughout Maryland's history. They were also the richest people who ever lived in Talbot County, before or since. Um, and they intertwined constantly with the Tillmans, and it is Tillmans who own the property now. So they're descendants of the Lloyds, but they're the Tillman side. Also intertwined with a whole lot of other political families like Talos and and um, so, Tees and so forth. So who's left today? Okay, the the people who live in the house are actually Tillmans, um, and 
a lot of the outbuildings are homes of other Tillmans, then they all kind of get together. It's my understanding. I'm not an expert on the entire Tillman family, obviously. But the matriarch of the family is Mary Tillman, whom you would have met today. She knows everything, <laughs> so she can tell you all of it. Oh, the, good. Maybe we can, we can fi the find her. She was from the how, family of how unusual is it that this is open to the public today? It's very unusual. I've lived here since 95. This is the first chance I've gotten to get in. <laughs> so, yes, this is a real treat today. Yeah, they, they had some kind of an event recently, but I can't ever be sure whether it was the Y House or the Y Plantation, which is open more often. So this is the Y House? This is the Y House. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you see if you can find Mary for me? Is she, yeah, is she back in the she, Actually, she got in the golf course, so let's find out where they took her. And you're coming back today? I'm coming back today. Uh, this was set up by a friend of mine. I did not know whether or not this would actually happen. And uh, he said, well, let me look into it, Frederick. And uh, uh, he got back to him and he said, oh, Mr. Lord said that he would be very happy to receive you. And so... Uh, this is 18... Well, this is 1881. And uh, Mr. Lord was called away for a meeting or something. Uh, the actual colonel, they are all colonels in one way or another. Uh, but his son uh, has received me and entertained me both me and my guests uh, quite lavishly. Were you nervous coming over on a battleship? Oh no, not nervous on a, on, on a battleship at all. I mean all. nervous, nervous getting off? Uh, no, uh, that's one of the great things because uh, in my other life I'm U.S. Marshal for the District of Columbia so I find myself uh, around military uh, hardware all the time living over in the nation's capital but uh, actually I felt quite protected. <laughs> now what's your fondest memory from here? My fondest memory from here, oh goodness, both my saddest and my fondest memory. My saddest was when I was first brought here, my grandmother. Uh, I thought that I belonged to my grandparents, uh, Betsy, Bailey, and my my grandfather, but it was only when I came here that I realized that I belonged to somebody called the old captain. So that was my darkest day. That first day I knew what I was slave. But my fondest memory was the last time I saw my mother, Harriet, uh, Aunt Katie, who was the cook in those days, who was uh, sort of stingy with the food. And when my mother found out about it, she read the Riot Act. And for the first time, I knew that I wasn't just a child. I was somebody's child. And so the fondest memory was that last night that I spent with my mother. And after I was asleep, she made that 12-mile walk back to the other farm that she was in. And she still stays in my heart. So that would be my fondest memory. Come back to Charles. Yes, sir. Where are you from? Texas County, Texas. Is that right? That's where I live. I live now. In my parents' home, uh, one block from where I was born and raised. Is I that right? I look out the door and see where I grew up, the same neighborhood. And, yeah. So, But you're Frederick Douglass all over the country, right? Boston, I'm, all around? I'm Frederick Douglass from the coast of Maine to uh, San Diego, California, from Seattle all the way down to where I'll be in about three weeks to the coast of Florida and points in between. I'm all over the country. So you are the premier Frederick Douglass historian. I am one Frederick Douglass historian, yes. A uh, humble one, that's great. Uh, Fred Marcel, I must say. In fact, I am here because of Fred. Fred is a wonderful Frederick Douglass. We met, oh, back in 98 when the uh, International Year to Woman celebrated the 150th year of the women's rights movement, which Frederick Douglass second in Seneca Falls in 1848. And Fred was up there, Mrs. Clinton was up there, and all the folks in the movement was there. But they contacted Fred two years ago to do a performance as Douglas, and Fred was not available. He said, I know this person you can get, I'll call Charles Pace, and that's why I'm here. That's great. So we're, we're all colleagues and support each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Yes, sir. <laughs> so we're with Mary Donald Tillman, and you are the 12th generation Eleventh, uh, the eleventh generation, oh, right? That's lived on this property. That's correct. So how and long? It's owned it actually. It's owned it, right? Mm -hmm. So have you been your entire life living here? No, I have not. I came here off and on from the time I was six months old, but it was not all the time. Um, I used to come down with my mother when I was a child, and then we spent every summer here for a while, and. Um, 
then my mother also lived down here, who was uh, Elizabeth Schuller's, Elizabeth Lloyd Schuller's older sister, and it was she who lived here uh, from 1948 until she died in 1993. Uh, so I visited all the time, and I inherited the property in 93. But my husband was a physician. Hello. And I, um, we lived in Baltimore. He was on the faculty at Hopkins. Oh, really? And we lived in Baltimore for 54 years. But we, again, I've been back and forth all my life. Now, how many acres do you have here? Approximately 1,300, of which 500 is woodland. About 12, roughly 1,200 is under cultivation. And um, then the garden, the house and garden make up about 150 acres. You must be very busy tending all the... Well, not now. Years. I've retired. You've retired. My okay. son's here. Your son's here. Oh, that's great. Okay. <laughs> terrific. Well, thank you very much for opening well, up your house. That, that's very rare. Well, we love having it. We love having people who really enjoy it see it. The event was magnificently planned and executed by organizers and volunteers of the St. Michael's Museum at St. Mary's Square in St. Michael's. Our only regret is we couldn't take our camera inside the main building to see some of the magnificent furnishings, as we were told, looking just about it the way it did back in the early 1800s. This is Will Howard, signing off.